2021's Godzilla vs. Kong was a dream come true for monster movie fans, reuniting two of cinema's greatest icons in a modern cinematic epic. The film had managed to turn a tidy profit despite being released during the coronavirus pandemic, and plans were soon set in motion to produce a further installment. This is the making of Godzilla Kong The New Empire. Since the inception of these characters, there has been a fascination with them around the world, and indeed each of them has left their mark on each other's markets. Godzilla creator Tomoyuki Tanaka has stated that he was influenced by King Kong, and Nintendo's popular character Donkey Kong also took inspiration from the American classic. Likewise, American audiences have long been obsessed with Godzilla, with the dubbing of these films becoming its own phenomenon, and with some Godzilla movies even being highly edited with new footage for localization. Toho made two Japanese King Kong films in the 1960s, including the original King Kong vs. Godzilla, and in 1998, Hollywood produced their own critically panned Godzilla film. That's a lot of fish. In the years that followed, efforts were made to produce a second American incarnation of Godzilla, while in parallel, Peter Jackson attempted to follow up his own 2005 King Kong film with one focused on Skull Island. Both of these projects found their way to the desk of legendary entertainment's Thomas Tall, who realized the potential of a shared universe. Three standalone films later, the two behemoths finally faced off in Godzilla vs. Kong from director Adam Wingard. I can almost not remember a time where Godzilla and King Kong weren't, you know, part of my life. The thing that draws me towards making these films is kind of getting in touch with that probably even four-year-old version of myself that really enjoyed watching these movies growing up. The filmmakers hoped that GVK would spark interest in further installments, but it all depended on how the film did. You know, I've done a lot of movies over the years and I've had ups and downs with the releases and you just, you learn to sort of like be ready for the worst. Needless to say, audiences were enthusiastic about Wingard's more colorful and fun take on monster movies, and the director was excited to continue the story. Pre-production on the next installment began in early 2022. Adam Wingard would return as director and would develop the story alongside his frequent collaborator Simon Barrett and Terry Rossio, who returned from the previous film. The first and most important decision to make was what would bring Godzilla and Kong back together? The writers settled on introducing a new ape villain, the Scar King. Kong has never really had an arch nemesis before. With this film, a lot of the drive of the film was gonna be Kong's personal story. We needed to create a villain that was sort of an anti-Kong. I wanted him to be this nefarious dictator titan. Scar King is attracted to power and control and all these negative traits that you know a dictator might have. This new installment would feature Godzilla and Kong not as enemies, but in collaboration. Collaboration. There's a truce, but it's an uneasy truce. Mm. You know, Godzilla's still sort of the overseer of the surface world, and Kong is now, he's overlooking the, the, the hollow earth, the underworld. They have to work together. It's a powerful duo. We're seeing them battle up against somebody, and they're not uh, enemies anymore. This choice led to a unique naming convention never before seen in film. It comes from the shorthand of uh, X standing for a collaboration. I'm surprised that nobody's ever used an X in their title like this before. That's why we have an X there now, because we're trying to squash this beef. Another important objective for the film was creating a suitable evolution for the characters. We were always trying to find ways to kind of evolve the characters, and, and Godzilla obviously has a major evolution. There's actually a reasoning behind why he actually turns pink. It's not just like he evolves and for some reason, the blue turns to pink. And Godzilla is sprinting more than he's ever sprinted before <laughs> because this is his evolved form. He does have a bit more of a capacity to uh, haul ass. With Kong, we were kind of inspired in more of like an anime direction. As we've gone kind of like more wild tonally, it's kind of given us license to see him wearing a, uh, a mechanical uh, glove on his arm. In these films, Godzilla and Kong are not just monsters, they're characters, and treating them like real characters was so important. 
I wanted to make a monster film that was primarily told from a monster's perspective and was very visually driven. Whether it's Kong, who's very human-like and relatable, and Godzilla has almost more of an animalistic stoicism. And it's interesting because the script actually was written in such a way that whenever Kong is trying to convey something, we actually wrote it out as dialogues. These aren't just like creatures, these are real characters with real feelings and emotions and they're conveying things to each other. So much of the Titan action is depicted at, not just at the eye level of the monsters, but from their perspective. And if you were a monster battling, you know, another monster, you know, everything's going to look just like it does if I'm fighting somebody else. It's going to be moving fast. One early idea for the sequel was to make it a Son of Kong film, and this would lead to the creation of the character Suko. The movie kind of started with Suko and it really grew around the concept of what if Kong met this younger version of himself. He's a little scrapper, he's a survivor, and he's been through a lot. I thought he was so cute. I think he's going to be a great impact and add additive to the movie. If it wasn't for the battle between Godzilla and Kong at first, Kong would never really know how to love. He yeah. wants to be a dad, a surrogate uh -huh. dad to this young kid who's been in this abusive relationship. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful story. The writers also created an exciting new foe for Godzilla, Shimo the Ice Titan. You know, I put a lot of personality into these new characters and just seeing people talk about those characters online as though they're already canon and a lot of people haven't even seen the film. There's just a lot of excitement for them. As for the cast, three actors would return from the previous installment. Rebecca Hall as Dr. Andrews. I had so much fun on the first one when the, when the call came that there was gonna be another one. I was like, absolutely, can't wait to get back into it. Brian Tyree Henry as Bernie Hayes. We created such a tight-knit family on this one, um, and it was truly fun to go to work every day. And Kylie Hoddle as Gia, the girl who shares a strong bond with Kong. Of course, I'm so happy to accept this role as Gia and continue her. Her and Kong, they've always had such a strong relationship, so it's a great journey that they're both on. New additions to the cast included prior Wingard collaborator Dan Stevens as Trapper, a music-loving tech expert. Working with Adam Wingard, he's preserved the same spirit of indie fanboy filmmaking just on a, on a larger scale, you know, and it's a really, really nice thing to see him carry that spirit forward. And follow Chan as the Hollow Earth's Iwi Queen. She's definitely very wise, uh, a lot older than everybody. She's probably hundreds of years old. Filming would commence in Australia in July of that year. There's so much joy to be had in these films, and I think that translates to the audience, the sort of fun that we had making it. I mean, I'm working with my friends now. The very nature of the film meant that the actors would face unique challenges in interacting with their co-stars. You don't know who you are as an actor until you have to act with cat toys. There was one particular day <laughs> where we had to work with a, a, a green screen foam finger. Oh. Just a guy with a pole <laughs> and a <laughs> foam <laughs> finger and you're watching Kaylee try to connect and then us being the adults, of course, yeah. are just, just cracking, cracking up. up. <laughs> exactly. Also, the neck hair, I forgot about yeah. that. The, the persistent Kong yeah. neck. The Kong neck. I didn't realize how Kong much neck. we struggled. Kong goes yeah. neck. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's what's not there, though, which should be as a set therapist afterwards, mm. so you can really feel like... And a chiropractor. Like, and a chiropractor, <laughs> because <laughs> you're just like... Dude, this is bad. Uh, this you're like, really what bad. am I doing, but then what is this? And like, how, like, it's all, you know... I think I know what Adam wanted. He would explain his vision, as it was written in the screen, so I didn't feel like there was a big, huge challenge for this. It's not often that we have a deaf character in movies at all. I think that's so great to have in a movie. Using the sign language on the screen, I wanna make sure that my sign is clear enough and that I am portraying the character and her sign language. I had an ASL master on set that would help me and rearrange the sign language or, or translate it better, so that's what I think was the biggest challenge. And then Gia, you know, our communication is so, pure and so simple but so effective and the fact that she has grown so much as an actress but also her character has grown so much that you know we were able to just immediately connect so let's unpack the heave because it's on these it's, different it's on you know what do they call it mm -hmm. um uh the uh, hydraulics yeah, hydraulic rig it's like yeah. the thing you go on in a theme park when yeah. you do the, the you simulator do a and we thought that we were like yo when this yeah. movie comes out maybe this will be a ride somewhere and then <laughs> like there's a like, whole like, like no like, <laughs> like yeah no I, i'm good i don't know whenever possible practicality was utilized to help achieve maximum realism the set is mostly built in reality. It wasn't just blue screens. 
So the pyramid that you see it was as high as you know the studio could build inside. Obviously, we never get to act with Godzilla or Kong, but everything else is sort of as you see it. Like the sets are mm -hmm. are built and yeah. made, and if they're not built, then they're in, we're in the jungle. We're in the rainforest. Really? The Dane Tree Forest is like one of the most prehistoric, ancient. Some there's some foliage in there that you don't find. There's also a wonderful planet. creature called the cassowary. The cassowary, which is the, it's the a dinosaur. It's a descendant dinosaur. of the velociraptor. Velociraptor. We were there in the in the when they have all their babies, babies and you yeah. don't and it was we got all these warnings ahead of time like if you see a cassowary do not look it in the eye. I always wanted to go into the jungle during the rain and I would go and it was so beautiful and natural but the worst part is when I was in my suit it was so hot because it was hot at the same time there so I would have to run a lot with a jacket on and that was the worst but it was so beautiful seeing the rainforest. Filming continued in locations around the world and by November the film had wrapped. As for the monsters themselves, motion capture was once again utilized and artists and animators went to painstaking lengths to achieve the best possible results. They're looking great! They're looking fab. Movie magic! Yeah, they Movie are. Movie magic! Yeah. The way that we treated the CGI sequences is though they're really photographed with real lenses and, you know, it wasn't about creating like, like the perfect, you know, you know, clean shot of, you know, like a titan, it was about trying to make it almost looked messy and dirty as though it was really photographed by a real uh, film lens. Every VFX shot created for IMAX, it's exclusively made and framed in such a way uh, to be optimally seen in IMAX. As the film's 2024 release date drew closer and closer, another Godzilla film began to gather attention. Godzilla Minus One, the latest Japanese installment in the iconic franchise. The film was a box office triumph around the world and even provided inspiration to Adam Wingard's production. You have that great shot where you show the scales and they're popping up, which I thought was such a brilliant idea. It's kind of like a gun cocking or something, but I thought that was a really, really amazing sequence. Just a few short weeks before New Empire hit theaters, Godzilla Minus One earned the franchise its first ever Academy Award, taking home the Oscar for Best Visual Effects. Indeed, there is no better time to be a monster movie fan. Director Adam Wingard hopes that a third Godzilla Kong crossover will soon follow. If this movie's successful, you know, the MonsterVerse, uh, you know, has got a lot of ground to cover. So um, ideally we'll see lots of, uh, um, you know, original characters uh, showing up. Every generation has managed to find something fresh and new in, in, in the sort of giant metaphors that they are. Um, and that they represent, and uh, and also as the technology has evolved, and we, you know we've been able to kind of explore their story. So they've gone from being just sort of roaring things that climb the Empire State Building to to creatures that are the characters in movies that have an actual storyline uh, that is heartfelt, and we really connect with them now because of you know what we're able to to create and show audiences. I think that there is a sense that they are they are larger than life, literally. They're larger than people. There is the sense of enormity of awe when you go to this. It's sort of what cinema is built for is to feel this kind of something that is fantastical and huge and bigger than us. And I think there is something sort of oddly humbling in that. I watched it with my family. Everything just came together. It looked so perfect and so smooth by the end of the movie. And it was just amazing to be able to see the work that they put into it. And I think the things that you loved about Godzilla vs. Kong, you can expect to love and some in this one. It's, it's, it's bigger, it's, it's brassier, it's funnier, it's sillier. It has a sort of punk rock aesthetic mixed with a kind of family fun goofiness. Both Godzilla and King Kong have long been important parts of popular culture. Beyond just glorious escapism, they provide a lens for us to examine the world we live in. And what better message to share with the world than that two rival monsters could put aside their differences and come together in collaboration? Fans of these cinematic icons have loved the journey so far, and they can't wait to see what the future holds.